Well, thank you very much, uh, George, and welcome everybody to the Commonwealth Club. And as is our custom, we will start with the gavels, my favorite part. Good evening, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the club's YouTube channel. I'm John Diaz. I'm the editorial page editor for the San Francisco Chronicle and your moderator for tonight's program. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest, Francis Fukuyama, noted political scientist, senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and author of the new book, The Dem Identity, The Demand for Dignity, and the Politics of Resentment. Dr. Fukuyama has written widely on issues concerning political development and international pol political economy. His background includes working at the RAND Corporation and serving as a member of the U.S. State Department during the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. In his new book, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, Dr. Fukuyama addresses the issues of identity politics, which will be the subject of our conversation today. He argues that our connection to personal identities has disconnected us from universal understandings of human dignity. He agrees that identity is fundamentally democratic and is indeed a pillar of fledgling democracies. However, he says narrow identities can pit groups against one another and manipulate people's ability to recognize or seek out mutually inclusive solutions. To discuss all this, please give a Commonwealth Club welcome to Dr. Francis Fukuyama. Thank you. So, Dr. Dr. Fukuyama, first of all, welcome. It's a, a pleasure, terrific book. Um, would it, maybe you can start by giving us a sense of what inspired this book, which seems particularly timely right now? <laughs> well, I mean, frankly, it was the uh, elections of uh, 2016. Uh, I study international uh, democratic, uh, inter uh, democratic institutions around the world, but it was becoming increasingly uh, evident that the United States was becoming one of the more problematic uh, democracies with the election of Donald Trump and the rise of populism. And it was clear that this was not just an isolated phenomenon. It was behind the Brexit vote. You've got populist regimes now in Hungary and Poland and Turkey. You've got anti-immigration parties all over uh, Europe. And so I think this is a threat to democracy. These populist parties are usually led by charismatic figures who are very anti-institutional. They say, I've got a direct mandate from the people and therefore I don't need judges or you know, the mainstream media, enemies of the people. Uh, and that, uh, you know, is dangerous to democracy. Uh, so that was really, I think, the motive. I, w I was struck. I, th this summer, I went to uh, Malaysia and the Philippines to look at the uh, uh, populism and identity politics there. As you rightly note, this is something that is going on throughout, throughout the world. What is the common thread here? Is it that it worked one place so others are emulating it? Or is there something going on internationally that's causing people to... Um, engage in identity yeah. politics? Well, I think that there are a couple of common triggers. So there's a psychological basis for it. So identity is based on the idea that I have this inner self. It may be hidden. Uh, other people do not respect it. Uh, and what I demand of other people is that they recognize the dignity of that inner self. And it can be defined by me as an individual, but also by my membership in a group, by a nation, by a religion. Uh, and that's what leads, uh, you know, the, the assertion into politics. Now, why it started in, you know, this past decade, uh, I think it varies in different parts of the world, but in the developed world, I think it's a reaction to globalization. You've had uh, this 40-year period of a liberal international order where you've had the speeding up of the movement of goods, people, services, investment all over the world. It's made the world very rich, but it's not made everybody rich. Uh, and in particular, working classes in rich countries have lost employment uh, and lost ground uh, to elites. And I think that was really the trigger. Uh, in fact, after the financial crisis, I kept wondering why there wasn't a populist explosion given what had happened. 
Uh, it just happened, though, that the explosion took this identity form and it came out on the right rather than on the left because it was also accompanied, I think, by you know, really big movements of people across international borders. Uh, and so it's very much tied up with the immigration uh, issue and opposition to the kind of rapid cultural change that I think many countries have experienced. One of the things we've seen here in the United States is when you talk about identity politics, is certainly economics are, are a factor, but there's a lot of different identities yeah. that are being exploited by candidates in different ways. Sure. Well, so I, in the book I give a little history of uh, the modern form of identity uh, politics. Uh, I think that it really starts on the left in the 1960s as a consequence of all the big social movements. So you have the civil rights movement, you have the feminist movement, you have the LGBT movement for the disabled, Native Americans. All of these groups uh, experienced marginalization uh, by mainstream American society. They were not recognized. They did not have adequate uh, you know, recognition of that inner uh, dignity. You think about, so Me Too has been a, <laughs> I would say, a rather prominent issue, especially in the past week. And if you think about what that what's driving that. There is an economic component to it, but it basically is a form of dignity politics because women want to be taken you know, seriously as human beings, not as sexual objects, not as you know, playthings and so forth in the way that men uh, have often treated them. Uh, and the demand is that they be recognized. And so all of those, I think, are driven by absolutely just you know, uh, uh, real social problems. Uh, and uh, it, has, it has sort of multiplied and divided into you know, ever finer groups. And I think what's happened with the rise of Donald Trump is that that form of protest has now migrated over to the right. Uh, so you now get white nationalists and, you know, and, and, and I think people that some, in, in many cases are not necessarily racist or xenophobes, but there are many white working class Americans who feel unrecognized, they feel uh, invisible, uh, that the elites really have not paid much attention to deindustrialization, to the outsourcing of jobs, to you know, their decline, the opioid crisis that's killed 72,000 Americans you know, in 2017, did not get front page treatment you know, by, by uh, uh, a lot of the mainstream media until, you know, until the election. So all of those, I think, are another form of identity that has now spread you know, throughout the political spectrum. Can you, can you really trace it that way, though, to the left, to the right? You mentioned mm -hmm. migrating to the right with Donald Trump, but in the 50s we had Joe McCarthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly had uh, other demagogues, and, and you know, even, even here in uh, California, Pete Wilson in 1994 running for re-election basically vilified mm -hmm. uh, immigrants very successfully to, in a come-from-behind uh, um, campaign. Is it, it's, it hasn't always cleanly gone left and right, has it? Well, no. Uh, so it, it's absolutely correct that there have always been racists and, you know, the John Birch Society and so forth. George but Wallace. Yeah, plenty of them. But I do think that the new form of it is different uh, in several respects. But, you know, the main one is it, it takes that identity framing uh, that developed on the left. That is to say, <clears throat> you get, you know, kind of working class white Americans that say, you know, we're victims. Uh, we have been ignored by the mainstream society. Uh, you know, we're like a, a, a victimized minority uh, that's invisible to the rest of, you know, the mainstream. Um, and that's something new. I mean, if you were a white American 50 years ago, you wouldn't have thought of yourself as a member of a special group of called white people, you know, that had this, this funny status, you just say, I'm an American. Whereas now, I think, you know, the framing uh, that's a victimization that developed on the left quite legitimately uh, is now being borrowed by, you know, by people that used to be part of, uh, of the mainstream. Uh, and then the issue of political correctness, I mean, this is where I think it's very clear that, you know, there was a response that if you think about why Donald Trump has managed to get away with the stuff that he's gotten away with, you know, insulting Mexicans, you know, uh, 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 assaulting women, uh, all of these things that should have sunk other politicians. Part of his appeal is precisely that he's not politically correct, that he's unafraid to, 
and, and the political correctness is a product of identity politics. It's not being able to say anything that would be taken or interpreted as denigrating the status or the dignity of a particular group. And he revels in doing that. I mean, he, you know, uh, and I think that, you know, that's, that kind of response is something new in our politics. I mean, you hear so many people talk about, well, what they like about Donald Trump is he says what he thinks, mm -hmm. as if, and by implication, that's what, yeah. that's what his supporters think as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of that is, is Donald J. Trump, and, and how much of this is a fundamental change in American politics? Well, so he was really brilliant, uh, especially in his use of Twitter, because when he tweets early in the morning, everybody knows that that's really him, right? I mean, with George W. Bush, Obama, they, they used Twitter, but everybody knew that they had a big committee of people that was vetting everything they said, and it wasn't really their innermost thoughts. And so he's practicing, you know, and that's what's at, at the core of identity politics. I've got this inner authentic self. That's what really is, has the moral valuation. The rest of society are a bunch of hypocrites and, and you know, um, people that, that, you know, are wrong about their their understanding of, of me. And so he's practicing this politics or ethics of authenticity. You know, he's the real, uh, he's the real deal. Now, whether it's just him, I think it's not. I think it's a much deeper thing. Uh, there's been some very interesting books written in the past few years, like Arlie Hochschild at, at Berkeley, sociologist, and interviewed a lot of Tea Party supporters in rural Louisiana. Uh, and this was written, you know, before the election. She has this central metaphor uh, that her respondents envision standing on a line leading to a little house in the distance that said the American dream and they're all waiting to get into this house and then all of a sudden they see people cutting in line in front of them. So they're, you know, African Americans, women, Syrian refugees, you know, immigrants, uh, and they think that that's, you know, very unfair. And so I think that this kind of resentment by, you know, especially working class, you know, members of the former, you know, majority community in the United States has been brewing. It's been accelerated by their economic and social decline, um, but it's now burst forth, you know, in, in this particular forum, and we just were, you know, it was our luck that you got this pretty clever politician that saw that and exploited it and used it to get to the White House. Do you think we've lost our sense of national identity as Americans? I mean, there was certainly a time, you know, you're looking at the Supreme Court fight, there have been a number of appointees who have, you know, usually the vote would typically be in mm -hmm. the 90s in the 100-member Senate for mm -hmm. a, a confirmation, even somebody who was fairly ideologically defined. Now we're talking about uh, there may be one or two, possibly at the most, Republicans who, who defect, uh, and possibly none. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you look at things like when it came to issues like you know, solving a budget crisis instead of a government shutdown or or the U.S. going to, to war, where people tended to rally because we're Americans and because we had common goals. Have we lost that? No, we've completely, I mean, the polarization has been fed directly by this form of identity politics because one of the bad things about identity is that it tends to morally divide the world into the people that are in my identity group and then everybody else that's not. Uh, and, you know, the authentic people in my group are the good people and everybody else is bad. And that uh, makes for a very different kind of politics because it's hard to compromise uh, under those circumstances. You're dealing with moral categories rather than just how do you split the uh, economic pie. Uh, and I think that national, so actually national identity is one of my solutions to this because I do think we need to get back to an idea of an overarching identity. You know, so identities can be extremely small. You know, I mean, you have this proliferation of gender pronouns these days. Uh, so you can pick any one of a dozen different, you know, <laughs> gender pronouns to identify yourself. But you can also construct them in a large way. And I think one of the things leaders in this country have not been doing is emphasizing things that Americans hold in common which I believe should be something like a civic identity, meaning not tied to race, identity, or religion, tied to political values, tied to belief in the Constitution, 
uh, belief in the rule of law, belief in a principle of human equality as in the Declaration of Independence. And that is an identity that's really being chipped away. Uh, and honestly, it's by both the left and the right, right? So on the left, uh, there are some identitarians that say, no, actually the history of the United States is one of patriarchy and racism. And, you know, uh, and then on the right, uh, what I didn't expect to see in my lifetime is um, people trying to drag the United States back into an ethnically based, I mean, so I literally, I, I went to the office on Monday and I picked up my, my voicemail and the first message was from a very angry woman who said, you know, Mr. Fukuyama, I read your book and you say, you know, the Constitution doesn't define who the American people are. I'll tell you who they are. They're people that fought in the revolution and their descendants, you know, and all you people that came later, you know, have really been messing this up. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, I really do think that you, you there, there are people that thought that in the past, but I just think that unfortunately, you know, it, it's become much more common now to, to think that way in, uh, in the U.S. So, you know, the threat is coming in both directions. Although when you talk about things like um, the institutions of democracy, rule of law, freedom of the press, all these things are being undermined on almost a daily basis by the President of the United States. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's the, you know, he's a classic, I think, populist demagogue. I mean, he made this remarkable statement at the Republican National Com uh, Convention when he was nominated. You know, he said, I alone understand your problems and I alone can fix them. So you got to go back to like Mussolini, you know, to, to find a politician who spoke like that. And that is what makes him anti-institutional because if he represents the American people, uh, then he can define who's the enemy of the, that, that happens to be you, right? <laughs> um, so I've read. Yeah. I've heard. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, he therefore does not like any check and balance institution that gets in the way of his carrying out this mandate that he's got from the American people. And I think that's a kind of unique danger to our system that really has not, you know, no other president in my lifetime has really uh, gone in that direction. I certainly remember that very authoritarian statement during, during the convention, but even more recently, uh, when President Trump made the, uh, made the uh, he was at a rally and basically said, everything you see and you hear in the media is not happening. I mean, that, that, that's, yeah. that, that's taken away one of our common sources of information. Uh, and speaking of the media, which, it, which has certainly evolved from what it once was when you had like the three network nightly newses and, and you had uh, a few major newspapers that were, were driving, uh, driving the, mm -hmm. the agenda. Um, people don't have that common source of information. One of my, uh, one of my friends who's a political consultant calls it the iPodization yeah. of news where people, just like in your iPod, if you like a certain uh, genre of music, that's probably what you're gonna listen to you know, people are watching Fox News, which mm -hmm. I do occasionally to see, see what uh, is being, being said. I mean, that, that's, that certainly has to be a factor in this identity politics, that people look for that identity and their sources of information. No, I think that's right. I think the rise of social media has, is almost perfectly suited to promote identity politics because, you know, it used to be that before social media, if you had some crackpot theory, you know, like you live here in San Francisco and uh, you've got some crackpot theory, you know, right-wing conspiracy theory. You're not going to find very many people walking around the Embarcadero that are going to share your views. But then you get online and it turns out there's like a thousand other people around the United States that believe this completely insane story that, that you believe. And that reinforces, you know, you and you think, yeah, well, actually, you know, I'm right in this. Um, so I think the rise of social media has really... Uh, abetted this kind of compartmentalization into these so-called filter bubbles of people who, you know, reinforce uh, their own, uh, you know, strongly held views. You know, one of the things I think that as we, as you talk about the migration of identity politics to the right, uh, one of the things the right, I think, has done, and this president has done fairly effectively, is kind of point to the other side as as the purveyors of identity politics. Mm -hmm. Like, 
They're not for you. They're only for the immigrants. Uh, they're only for um, you, you know for women, uh, mm -hmm. women's groups or whatever. They're beholden to organized labor, etc. Et um, and and uh, recently, uh, our U.S. Senator uh, Kamala Harris actually had a speech in defense of identity politics. Mm -hmm. That it that it's okay that these groups that maybe historically have been ignored are yeah. getting a voice. Well, so let me make something clear. I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, African Americans, women, gays and lesbians pushing back. So every one of them has, in fact, uh, or every individual uh, in a group like that has a different lived experience that's different from that of other people. And so the forms of discrimination are specific to these groups. Uh, in fact, they're specific to subgroups, you know, within them. Uh, and if they want to push back about police violence or you know sexual assault that's something that's very important to do so there's nothing wrong with that process that's simply a process of mobilizing for social justice uh, what I think you know to me the the issue though is that well that process can go wrong under a, a, a couple of different circumstances so when your group identity you start to believe becomes so overriding that it determines what you think about you know politics, society, culture, uh, in a determinative way, then that begins to undercut this liberal principle that we are individuals, you know, who think for ourselves, responsible for our own, you know, uh, decisions, and not, you know, and we get our status not uh, as, as individuals and not just because we're members of certain groups into which we're, uh, into which we're born. Um, and then I, I think, you know, really, in order to have a democracy, you have to have a common uh, democratic identity, right? You have to believe that your basic institutions are legitimate. You know, you don't have to agree with other people, but you have to believe that the way that you select leaders, the way that you enact laws is a fundamentally just process and um, that you will accept, you know, losing an election or you'll accept, you know, a policy that you don't like as long as that overall framework exists. And unfortunately, the degree of polarization right now is getting to the point where people are increasingly, you know, contesting that. I'd be interested in your, your impression as someone who has worked in a couple of uh, administrations is to, when I look at it, like, over my lifespan, I really see three presidents who have had an ability to really transcend uh, ideal, uh, ideology to really reach out to groups that traditionally did not vote for their party, did not vote for candidates like them. Mm -hmm. One, obviously, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, I would say, as well, and then Barack Obama. It almost looked like we were moving into a, uh, I mean, who among us 20 years ago would mm -hmm. have thought that we would have seen an African-American president in our right. lifetime? Uh, but all three of those presidents had that ability to to sort of transcend their, their natural base, if you will, to use a word that I hate that's <laughs> used so much now. No, that's right. Uh, and I think that, you know, in a way, Obama, I mean, his signature achievement was the Affordable <laughs> Care Act, which in my view is the way that progressive people ought to think about, you know, social justice. It ought to be in terms of these universal programs. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the celebration of a post-racial America was really... Um, premature and, you know, I hate to say, but I think race has become, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not only not uh, disappeared as an issue, but it's really become one that has defined uh, a lot of politics. So the Republican Party has been moving over the last 20 years to being the party of white people and the Democratic Party has been moving to being a party of uh, minorities plus professional women. And uh, that's not a good way to organize our politics, I think. And it's certainly not good for the Republican Party, as we've seen here in California, as the demographics of California have shifted. The Republicans now are third in, in voter registration behind Democrats, declined the state, and then Republicans are down basically to one out of four voters in mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. I think that... Um, the Democrats, though, really have a big choice in front of them, you know, in the future, because they have won elections by mobilizing their identity groups. And so if you went to Hillary Clinton's website, you know, she didn't have like one or two big ideas. I mean, there's like 15 of them 
reflecting you know, the particular demands of these particular identity groups. And it's understandable why democratic politicians do that because that's the way you mobilize, you know, all the activists live in those identity groups and that's the way you get people out to the polls and so forth. However, but you know, one of the consequences of that strategy though has been to drive a lot of uh, white voters, especially white working class voters, away from the Democratic Party. Now this, is, this didn't begin in 2016. You know, this has been happening ever since Ronald Reagan. Uh, but that really accounts for the loss of these big industrial states in the Electoral College, you know, Pennsylvania, Mis Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. And I think the big choice that the party has to make is whether in the future it proceeds down that route of mobilizing those identity groups uh, with the activists or whether it tries to win back some of those white voters. I mean, so just for instance, I mean, in a week with, with the Kavanaugh decision, you know, hanging over us, uh, you have to remember that a majority of white women voted for Donald Trump in 2016, you know, which is quite remarkable for all of the insulting things he said and did about women, still a majority of white women voted. And so it means that for them, you know, his politics, you know, and I, I'm, it could be driven by a lot of things, by economics, by just party loyalty, but all of those things overrode, you know, the, the, the gender issues. And so they're not determinative, you know, for an important group of voters. So that's, you know, that's one of the considerations I think, you know, people in the, on the progressive side really have to have to think about. How much do you think the internet and, and social media in particular has to do with this phenomenon of identity politics? When I talk to political consultants and they talk about how they do advertising, I mean, gone are the days when they want to do generic advertising to yeah. the whole whole public. They want to buy uh, basically from social media groups, uh, social media providers. They will find out exactly, you know, which voters are, or which which users are are following which things, and then from there they can extrapolate which other uh, of right. their friends are likely to do it. I mean, it's much more easy to exploit than I remember back in the day, supposedly when, when Phil Burton was doing redistricting, he would send aides out to neighborhoods and say, let me know what people are driving, because I can tell by you know, whether they have pickup trucks or BMWs, whether they're going to vote Republican or right, Democrat. Right. I mean, it's a lot more sophisticated now. No, it is. Uh, and you know, it reflects the fact that these demographic characteristics do determine the way people in the aggregate vote. However, uh, it does seem to me that it would be a little bit too bad if everybody simply voted based on, you know, their skin color, their gender, you know, uh, these fixed characteristics um, and couldn't make up their minds about policy issues based on kind of deliberation and, and dealing with facts. And, you know, the fact of the matter is in American politics, uh, you have had leaders that have been transformational that actually persuade people to think about things differently, uh, such that you know the way that they were born or even the party affiliation into which they're born doesn't actually determine you know how they come out. So in a way, you know I guess what I think we need is a kind of leadership that will get us beyond this kind of demographic targeting uh, that assumes that we have these fixed preferences and that as Americans we're not capable of actually changing our minds about things. Before we go to audience questions, and there's a lot of good ones coming in, you see a leader out there who fits that qual qualities? Um, not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just was hoping as we're doing our endorsements for, for the midterms. Here's an audience question. Research, research shows that big economic dips are always followed by right-wing populist movements. How do you account for that? First of all, do you agree with that? In, do you, how do you account for I don't think that's right. I mean, if you think about the 1930s, we had a much bigger recession, 25% unemployment, uh, you know, GDP goes down, uh, you know, 10, 20%. I mean, it was a really big shock and you had populism, but that was mobilized by Franklin Roosevelt and it went on, you know, he went on to create the New Deal coalition. So I think that actually these populisms are actually pretty malleable. Uh, and that's why I think leadership actually matters a great deal. So in Europe, they had the bad fortune of getting some right-wing populists that steered that same kind of anger in a, you know, towards fascism. 
Whereas in the United States, we had leadership that actually used that anger to build uh, the modern welfare state and you know the kind of um, social protections that we've kind of come to take for granted. So I don't think it's, it's inevitable. Can you expand on your comment in the book with regard to universal guaranteed income that you do not see it being an ideal solution to job yeah. loss? Well, the basic issue has to do with dignity uh, because I think that the demand for dignity is a separate thing from economic you know, desire, uh, that we want, we want respect and a lot of times we want respect even if it means that we have to suffer economically for it. Um, but the two are clearly related and oftentimes uh, I think what we assume to be economic motivation is actually dignity motivation, that we want that really beautiful, you know, Tesla because, not because we think that, you know, it's such a great car, but our neighbor doesn't have one and, you know, it gives us status, you know, to, to be driving this sort of thing or maybe we're environmentally, you know, appropriate and so forth. Um, and so I think that um, that demand for, you know, respect is a, is a you know, is a, separate, uh, is a separate driver of human motivation and therefore has to be addressed separately from, you know, from economics. Please comment on the role of universities. Oh, I'm sorry, and I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't get to the universal, uh, this was gonna lead up to my, my problem with universal basic Guaranteed. income is that part of what gives you dignity uh, in having a job is the fact that society thereby says, you're doing something useful, you know? It's useful enough that we're gonna pay you a salary. Uh, and that's the trouble, I think, with universal basic income is that you're just being paid for being alive. Uh, and there's no dignity component to that. And so it's just not clear that even though that might keep you alive, whether that's actually gonna make you feel good about yourself. Uh, I think that you know, is a more fundamental problem. Please comment on the role of universities in the polarization yeah. of America. So uh, this is a tough question because I think <laughs> it's, partly, it's partly an empirical one. So there's no question that there is a lot of, I think, ridiculous identity politics on university campuses. It's not just there, it's in the arts, you know, the humanities more broadly, uh, where people you know, are just so utterly sensitive about some of these dignity questions that they end up being very intolerant and you know, shutting down people that even dare to utter you know, certain phrases, this sort of thing. So there's no question this is going on. In fact, it's led to violence in certain cases, but I do think that it's also the case that it's deliberately picked up by conservatives to you know, denounce academia as a whole and you know, as a way of characterizing everybody on the left as being completely consumed by, uh, by this sort of identity politics. And as an empirical fact, I'm just not sure you know, whether that's true. I, I know that the attitudes of students have shifted in that direction you know, quite substantially. Uh, but in my own dealings, um, you know, I, I, I see a, sometimes a different reality. So for example, Charles Murray came to Stanford last uh, winter. I debated him, actually. Uh, and we didn't have any trouble. You know, it wasn't like Middlebury College. Uh, and he was telling me that he's actually given you know, dozens of talks around the country at, you know, different schools and universities, you know, without any problem. And so, you know, the idea that there's no free speech or no possibility of, you know, debate, uh, I mean, a Richard Spencer, you know, or, uh, I mean, I'm not sure that he really qualifies as, as a, you know, somebody uh, <laughs> that really ought to be in a, in a academic setting, but I think that people with heterodox views, you know, can still, can still, uh, uh, can still find a voice. Do you think Stanford is, is typical there or maybe an aberration? Certainly in Berkeley has had a lot more problems than Stanford. Yeah, uh, well Stanford's had, um, Stanford's had its share of it. I mean, uh, you know, Stanford was the place where Jesse Jackson came in the 1980s with a hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's gotta go. Um, and I think that one of the consequences of that is that you know, there's really, uh, it's not been possible for Stanford to actually define a core curriculum of ideas that it thinks that, you know, its students need to, 
know to be you know, citizens and, and you know, mature human beings. And I'm afraid that that's true at a lot of other universities as well, especially the more elite ones. But you don't have the same degree of, of student radicalism uh, there that you do at Berkeley, obviously. Here's my favorite question so far. Which countries in the world today do you identify as not suffering from identity politics, and what can the United States learn from them? Good, that's a good question. So take Canada and Australia, which are really interesting cases because both of those countries have higher percentages of foreign-born uh, people uh, living in them than the United States. The United States is about 15%. Canada is well over 20 You know, Australia is... I think somewhere in the teen, high teens, uh, and yet they neither country has a populist backlash party, no demagogic, you know, equivalent of Donald Trump, uh, and so the question is why, uh, and that, you know, it's a complicated one. One thing is that neither country has really experienced a big downturn, especially Australia. I mean, they've been going for decades without a recession, and they haven't experienced deindustrialization the way that the United States has. But I also think that it could lie in their immigration policies because both of them have skill-based uh, immigration policies and both of them are actually pretty uh, strict at controlling illegal immigration uh, to the point that Australia, you know, when it sees a boat full of refugees, sticks them in Vanuatu or Papua New Guinea or Nauru rather than letting them land in Australia. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty tough policy for which they've been criticized, but I think one of the consequences is that they haven't had the kind of backlash that you've seen in Germany or France or the United States or, you know, or other places. Well, it's interesting uh, in terms of immigration here in the United States. I mean, when you go to Silicon Valley, I mean, they are craving, uh, those companies are craving more Im immigration. Certainly, the agriculture and construction sectors mm -hmm. here are certainly welcoming uh, immigrants. And, and the thing that we hear from all of these businesses is that they're not taking away jobs from um, Americans who are here, but rather expanding opportunity. Like in Silicon Valley, these companies say, we can't hire enough people without reaching outside the U.S. No, yeah, I mean, I think that's clear that, I mean, if you look at the CEOs and the biographies of a lot of the leaders in Silicon Valley, you know, they're they're first generation immigrants to the United States. And so you think in, on net, you know, how many jobs have they created? I mean, a lot. Um, what role do you think marketing to identities plays in identity politics? Marking? Marketing. Oh, marketing. Marketing to identities. I mean, not only from politicians, but also commercially. Madison Avenue certainly uh, does a lot of marketing to identities. Yeah, I, I think that in a capitalist economy, you know, you're going to get people that will basically, uh, you, you know, they're not thinking about what's right, you know, for, uh, you know, the political order as a whole. I mean, they're just thinking about kind of short-term advantage. So Colin Kaepernick, you know, and Nike, uh, I mean, the background of this is, is a president that has, I think, kind of brilliantly exploited, you know, racial division you know, in that whole approach to the NFL. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, Nike saw an opportunity to go in the other direction and given who their customer base is, you know, maybe that's a correct decision. But on the whole, I don't think we want to move to a United States in which essentially corporations that sell to consumers are making calculations like politicians trying to get votes in an election saying, okay, we you know, we're going to go after this particular demographic and we know we're going to lose this other one, you know, because, uh, you know, because of the existing polarizations. I mean, most corporations would stay away from that kind of marketing, but we're seeing the beginnings of, you know, a shift in that direction. And that, you know, that's, that's fairly dangerous. Although one thing we've seen over the years is that, you know, corporate America follows politics and fo politics follows corporate America. I remember the landmark book in, in, of the 1968 election about uh, Richard Nixon and, and basically how he put together a team that basically sold him like a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> and the effects were similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, a question. Uh, isn't it true, don't you like questions that start, isn't it true? 
Uh, isn't it true that Donald Trump really is a culmination and not a start? Yeah, so that he is, um, he is building on an existing polarization that has been building really since the late 1980s. It really got started in a big way in the 1990s, you know, when, with the rise of Newt Gingrich uh, and this kind of um, winner-take-all politics, you know, in, in Congress. Uh, and that uh, basic polarization has just been getting worse uh, year after year. And it was very bad. I mean, look, honestly, if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she would have had a horrible time governing because probably, you know, at least one House of Congress would have still been held by the Republicans. That had hobbled Barack Obama for the, you know, the second, you know, his entire, well, actually, ever since 2010. Um, and uh, I think that that's led to these big, you know, um, dysfunctions in the political system. And so, yeah, so in that sense, he is a, a culmination. But he does have very distinctive uh, features that are really new. So this complete turn against internationalism, right? You had that uh, in the Republican Party in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and then it was basically exercised. Uh, in the Truman uh, administration when the country finally reconciled itself to being internationalist and being heavily engaged in the world. Uh, and honestly, that kind of just outright isolationism has not really been um, a main current in the Republican Party, and now Trump has turned that around. I mean, the, the, you know, the polling data on Russia is really incredible. So when Obama tried to do the reset with Russia, you know, just in the single digits, Republicans thought that was a good idea, and now that Trump is saying that it's a good idea, you know, half the party thinks that we should have better relations with, you know, with Russia. And so, you know, I, I guess as somebody that looks at international democracy, uh, one of the things that really worries me about this rise of identity is that it's completely changing the basic axis of global politics, right? So politics in the 20th century used to be aligned along an economic axis between a left and a right. So the left wanted redistribution, social justice, you know, strong welfare state or even state control over the economy. The right wanted a capitalist market, greater f individual freedom, uh, and so forth. And, you know, that led to lots of conflicts. But in a, in a certain way, these economic issues were easier to bridge. What we are starting to move towards is a world in which basic identity, you know, based on biological characteristics like ethnicity uh, or race is becoming, uh, or religion uh, is becoming what defines the nature of, you know, these regimes. So in Hungary, Viktor Orban basically told his, his countrymen, Hungarian national identity is based on Hungarian ethnicity, right? That's fine, except for the fact that there are a lot of non-Hungarians that live in Hungary, and there's a lot of Hungarians that live outside of Hungary. So, you know, that's setting up uh, grounds for a lot of intolerance and, and, you know, problems in foreign policy and so forth. Um, Prime Minister Modi in India uh, is taking a country that was actually remarkably liberal uh, ever since independence, and he's shifting national identity to one based on Hinduism. BJP, his party, is a Hindu nationalist party. So again, you know, there's 150, 200 million Muslims, Christians, you know, a lot of other people that are not Hindu in that country. Uh, and so all of these things are setting up big social conflicts uh, in the future. And if you look at this rise of Putin's popularity in the Republican Party, it's not just because of Trump, it's really because of this fundamental redefinition of what it means to be American because a lot of people on the right are increasingly coming to say, well, actually, no, what it means to be an American is to be Christian, you know, to be anti-gay marriage, to be, um, you know, a guardian of an ancient culture, and ultimately a lot of that is defined in ethnic terms. Uh, and that's why they actually, you know, and there, there's quite a number of of conservatives in the last couple of years that have said, I would actually pick Putin over Hillary Clinton, you know? Uh, now, 
that's not just Donald Trump. I mean, that's well, a that's a really big rethinking. The of, U.S. kind of did actually. <laughs> 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 Let me, let me ask you in terms of, um, you know, you talk about Trump's aversion to globalism and international relations. In some ways, though, as you, I'm sure you know from traveling around the world, even in, in nations where, at least on, on the government level, there's hostility to the, to the U.S., person to person, there's just like such an affection yeah. for the United States. And one of the things that really concerns, I think, a lot of folks outside of the U.S., is that they see Donald Trump basically emboldening their own leaders. Yeah. For example, was when I was in the Philippines, and um, people were telling me that President Duterte uh, never used the word fake news until Donald Trump kind of made it legitimate yeah. for him. Yeah. And we're seeing dissidents jailed in, in different countries and, and a lot of the same rationale being used. How much do you think um, the, the current administration is actually kind of fomenting this at nationalism and identity politics around the globe. The president is fomenting that. The rest of his administration is actually not so bad. <laughs> I mean, this is this weird thing about foreign policy right now. So as far as Donald Trump is concerned, I mean, another respect in which he's not just the culmination of things that have been going on is his attitudes towards democracy. I mean, ever, especially ever since Woodrow Wilson, every American president, Republican or Democrat, has said worldwide democracy is a good thing, you know, that, that there's a fundamental division in the world between democratic countries and authoritarian dictatorships, and we're on the side of the democracies. Trump is the first American president that has not agreed to that. So he's picked fights with all of our democratic allies, you know, from all these nice Canadians, you know, uh, uh, you know, to the Germans, Australia. To the, yeah, <laughs> Australia, uh, Mexico, and he really seems to like these strongman leaders like Sisi or Putin or Duterte. Um, you know, those are the people. Even Xi Jinping, although we're in a nasty trade fight with him, you know, he's still uh, Kim Jong Un. I mean, he's in love with Kim Jong. -un. I mean, what kind of a, you know. His what kind word. of a Republican? <laughs> what kind of a Republican? You know, would would utter something like that, uh, and so he's completely set that. Uh, you know, he's kind of reversed the 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 moral valence of democracy versus authoritarian government. But the rest of the government continues to operate as if you know he wasn't president. So we have actually stronger sanctions today than we did under Barack Obama against Russia. Uh, we continue to support, you know, I'm on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, which gives support to civil society groups, you know, around the world, pro-democracy civil society groups. Uh, we some, I sometimes feel that the only reason we've survived is that Donald Trump actually doesn't know that this organization exists, and so <laughs> it hasn't become a target, you know, but it's, it's really, you know, it, it's kind of the McCain wing of the Republican Party, which has basically disappeared. Uh, but nonetheless, it continues to go on like this machine that just, you know, will keep operating until, you know, it really runs into a brick wall. And so far, Trump has not, you know, I think been skillful enough as a president to really figure out how to get control of this machine. I was at a briefing at the State Department during uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, term uh, when Richard Holbrook gave a... Uh, a background beef briefing to reporters, and basically he was saying the thing about the State Department is he goes from one administration to the next, doesn't matter if it's you know uh, Republican to Democrat or whatever, foreign policy, 80 to 90 percent doesn't change. He goes, even though there may be a lot of fireworks over that 10 to 20 percent. I'm interested in your perspective as someone who worked in the uh, State Department. With this administration, mm -hmm. following up on your comments, are we still in that 80 to 90 percent range? Do you think, um, Obama? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would say so, um, with a, f a couple of caveats. That you know, Trump has done a tremendous amount of damage to the State Department, so they've lost a lot of very senior diplomats. You know, if I were a young person, I mean, that's what I do. I, I train people that want to do things like go into the State Department. Nobody wants to go there right now. You know, it's very demoralizing. And so the renewal of that agency and people that actually are interested in engaging in international 
affairs, I think that's all been, you know, very much weakened. But I'm struck. I mean, I travel all a lot, uh, and you know, uh, I, you know, I just find that all of the diplomats that I deal with, especially the foreign service officers or the professional people, actually are carrying on as if nothing had happened, and you know, they have to, they have to give the administration's line when they're instructed to, but you know, by and large, they really want to maintain that kind of continuity. How important is the strength of individual leaders versus the strength of institutions in the protection of constitutional liberties? Uh, I think it's hugely important. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and it's related to this issue of identity because identities are really socially constructed, meaning you know, they are influenced by the way people talk about them, by leadership, by grassroots movements, and so forth. And I think that they can be pushed in more narrow and, you know, more broad ways. And that's the function, I think, of leadership, is to redefine, you know, what it means to be uh, American and, um, you know, what your inner identity really uh, revolves around. Uh, I think that a lot of the outcomes, you know, so, for example, we're talking about is... Are, are recessions followed inevitably by left or right wing populist movements? I think it's, you know, looking back on history, I think it's sort of a matter of luck. You know, it was a matter of luck that you had Roosevelt in the 1930s that pushed things in that direction. I think it was a sort of bad luck that we ended up with Donald Trump, you know, today because he, you know, this could have been done by a similar kind of demagogue at any point, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, but the fact that it, you know, it happened right now is partly the result of the fact that he just figured out, you know, how to do it and he, he made his, his move. And conversely, that's why I think that I'm not, you know, wholly pessimistic because I do think that with the right leadership, uh, you can turn a lot of the current situation around. Now, of course, people have to vote properly and that sort of thing. That matters also, but I think the leaders are important. How does class resentment fit into you know, your uh, portrait of identity politics. And, and we've seen it from both the left and the right. Traditionally, it's been more uh, the left, the Democrats that have pushed class resentment. Mm -hmm. Then you had conservatives like, say, a Paul Ryan uh, very adroitly uh, selling the message to, to Republicans that mm -hmm. uh, even though this tax bill may not benefit you, you may someday be in that 1%, so you want to, mm. you want to support it. And, and very successfully uh, sold that. Donald Trump kind of turned that on its head, and yet he's yeah. still doing the tax cuts for the 1%. So this is another social reality in the United States that people haven't really come to grips with, which is that I think the single biggest <laughs> actually determinant of your future is class defined by the level of education. So if you look at Americans generally uh, over the last 30 years, if you have a college education or higher, you've done really pretty well. And if you have a high school education or less, you've kind of fallen off of a cliff. And that's true across gender and racial and ethnic lines. And so African Americans have split you know, in that fashion. Uh, Hispanics have split. You know, women have split. Uh, and so forth. And so actually, I think, you know, education, I mean, I, I think that class uh, is actually kind of the central reality driven by these structural changes in the global economy. And that has dangers, I think, actually for both, you know, both parties, because, you know, the Democrats have tended to define um, the problem uh, of inequality in these identity terms, and so it's it's more associated with you know the particular identity group uh, that you're um, you're associated with, and as a result, have lost touch with a you know this large number of whites that are also economically uh, suffering. Now Donald Trump has you know inserted himself; he does not have a solution to that. Uh, you know his all of his policies to date have actually made them worse off, except in these, you know, uh, kind of dignity ways. And, you know, he, he talks the right language uh, that makes them feel better. But in terms of substantive policies, this tax cut, you know, basically it was an effort to redistribute money upwards to, you know, to people that have it already. Uh, so, 
uh, I think that what we need is, is actually an honest grappling with the problem of class because I do think that that's kind of the biggest problem that exists out there right now. You make a really good point about the role of education. Um, and and I, I will be interested in your thoughts as to whether we are seeding future generations of extending this uh, problem with identity politics and, and class resentment because you look at the schools, and particularly here in California, you know what they are now compared to what they were in the in the 70s, and and the master plan for higher education in mm -hmm. the 60s that basically made students who were of a who achieved a certain level could easily afford to go to the University of California, no tuition. Mm -hmm. Now it's uh, it's formidable, competing almost with uh, private schools. Are, are we setting ourselves up for a continuation of this phenomenon that you write about? Well, there's a lot of things that are contributing to that. So part of it is residential segregation by class. So Americans have been sorting themselves into neighborhoods that are you know, quite uh, homogeneous. I mean, that's part of the underlying reality that's driving the polarization. But a lot of that is determined by education. Uh, there's also this problem <laughs> Uh, among elites of you know what's called assortative mating that you tend to marry people that are similar to yourself and so well-educated people that are doing well uh, marry one another they have children that begin with a good genetic inheritance but then that's compounded by their parents ability to transmit social status wealth and resources and opportunities to them uh, the one thing you will never get out of an elite school is how many legacy admissions uh, they, they have. Uh, but I'll tell you, the number is not insignificant, you know, because they're all trying to cultivate donors and school loyalty and that sort of thing. And so all of these things, I think, really contribute to a, you know, an elite that is very self-contained. Uh, you know, it's, it's in many ways very hard to penetrate, you know, that because they've set up a lot of defenses that protect their uh, social positions and economic positions uh, and that also affects then the nature of education because since we educate people you know locally based on local tax bases and so forth and, and in fact in, in, it's not even the economic issue it's it's friends and family so if you live in a you know in a homogeneous community that has lots of really well educated you know so I live in Palo Alto that's super competitive, you know, uh, you're going to get a good education there, you know, regardless. But if you live in East Palo Alto or, you know, parts of the East Bay, very different kind of situation because of this residential uh, class, you know, based sorting. Uh, and I think that's one of the, you know, the, the fundamental issues that we've really not figured out how to grapple with. Yeah, in, in addition to the net, the economic inequalities from government on these schools, you have like parental involvement, fundraisers that, yeah. that really supplement it in a big way. If I could say one more thing about education, uh, which is a point also in the book, I think that we really don't do civic education anymore. Uh, so there's a lot of poll data that is just appalling, like, you know, 20% of teenagers can identify a single uh, right in the Bill of Rights you know, or can name the three branches of government, or, or can name one branch of the three branches. Um, and I think that there's just been a, you know, lack of attention to this. And partly, uh, well, it's been driven by a lot of things. I mean, it's driven by this kind of belief that you have to have STEM, you know, classes if you're going to get a job, and, you know, the, the civic stuff uh, comes later. But I think that the problem you see right now is that, you know, essentially you've got a president that does not understand the constitutional order. And a lot of people, a lot of other Americans don't really understand checks and balances, and they don't understand why the government is organized in the way that it is. And that's stuff that we should be teaching, you know, kids, uh, not just, you know, not just in, in K through 12. I think actually universities have failed in that job as well. I'm sure you stay in touch with some of your colleagues from the, your, your time in the, uh, in the Reagan and Bush administrations. Do they share some of your concerns, or is, is, is there support for Trump in, among them? 
so I, uh, first of all, I ceased being a Republican when I moved to California. <laughs> I figured there's no point in... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was several things. It seems to me the Republican Party, you know, I, the, the Republican Party I liked was, was Bush 41, you know, Brent Scowcroft, James Baker, those kinds of people. And they're just, they're not part of the party anymore. They've just been completely marginalized. Uh, so I feel that that party left me, plus which, you know, being a Republican in California doesn't, <laughs> you know, there's not much of a future there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but um, I must say that, uh, you know, so I had a lot of problems with uh, my neocon friends. Uh, you know, I was part of that group up until the Iraq war, and then I had a big break with them. And I must say that I am really, I admire them a great deal because all of them have been extremely principled with the rise of Donald Trump. I mean, they are among the most articulate, you know, critics of Trump and Trumpism. Uh, out there, uh, so uh, I think that you know it really depends. I, I, I'm also very disappointed in a lot of Republican friends I had, who don't, you know, they don't vocalize any criticisms, and you just don't, you know, they they complain about all sorts of other things, but never about the president. And I just think, you know, you're living through a moment where American democracy is under this really big threat, and you're not saying anything about, you know, what seems to me the central issue of our time, and. You know, I find that very, um, you know, very disappointing. And that's especially true in Congress, where the very few Republicans who are willing to speak out against this uh, um, diminution of, of democracy, you know, Jeff Flake or, you know, uh, to some degree Bob Corker, are people who are leaving. Yeah. I, I can't name a single Republican in the U.S. Senate or the House who's really spoken out forthrightly against the president. So you know what is going to change that, though, uh, is an election. So if uh, there's a blue wave and if there's a very clear repudiation of Trump this November and then again in 2020, uh, that, I think, will change that calculation because that's the moment at which a lot of these cowardly Republicans are going to realize that actually maybe aligning themselves with Trump uh, is not going to win them a general election and that he's a liability rather than an asset. And that's why I think that of all the checks and balances in the American political system, uh, the single most important one is an electoral check. In a democracy, basically when the people speak you know, very clearly about something, uh, that's what politicians pay attention to, which means that I think this election that we're going to have in how many days from now? I mean, we're counting well, down. Over a month. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, is really going to be one of the most important elections in American history because if that check does not arrive, uh, if the Republicans retain control of both houses, uh, I think Trump and the rest of his party are going to take that as a mandate that you know, the American people think there's nothing wrong with any of the stuff that we're uh, doing. Uh, whereas even if it's only taking the House of Representatives, it means that Congress can begin to fulfill some of its actual constitutional functions like holding hearings and you know, investigations and releasing data and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big deal what, what, what we're going to see on, uh, in November. Do you think, though, if, there, if this blue wave does materialize, as, as folks suspect it will, a lot of analysts think it will, I mean, it will be driven in no insignificant part by identity politics, will it not? I mean, women who are appalled at what's going on, African Americans who are appalled, uh, gays and lesbians who worry about their rights under a Supreme Court. Identity politics may be the thing that... I, yeah, so a lot of these elections are turnout driven, and it's true that a lot of activists that will get out and vote in a primary live in those groups, but Actually, you know, the key swing districts that are up for contest, a lot of them are actually uh, in swing states or they're ones where there's a, you know, a balance between the parties and lots of independents. And a lot of those voters, you know, it's complicated because, you know, the Democrats are counting on suburban women. And so that is an identity group that's going to be extremely important to them in this election. But, you know... Uh, 
there's a lot of other voters that will be attentive to other issues where that emphasis on identity may actually be a turn off rather than a turn on. And so it's, it's you know, uh, it's not a clear, I mean, this election clearly, you know, this, this gender issue is going to be extremely important. But, you know, down the road, I do think that there's still a, uh, something a little bit problematic putting too much weight in that basket. We have time for one more question. So let me just ask you quickly, do you see the evolution of a follow-up book coming here as you're watching all of this develop? <laughs> um, well, uh, ask me after November. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do think that, uh, you know, the big question in my mind is whether all of this populism that we're experiencing is like a stock market correction where, you know, the, the basic path of political development in the world is still towards democracy, like what Obama calls the arc of history, uh, or whether we're experiencing something much, you know, much more fundamental. And I think that, uh, you know, in, in a turn away from liberal democracy. Uh, and I honestly, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, and maybe there'll be another book, you know, once that becomes clearer. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking Dr. Francis Fukuyama, author of the new book, Identity, the Demand for Dignity, and the Politics of Resentment. I also want to thank everyone here tonight, a very well-behaved, attentive uh, audience, as well as our audience. In fact, they didn't even applaud when you talked about the blue wave. Uh, as well as our audience on radio, television, and the Internet. A reminder to everyone here that cop copies of Dr. Fukuyama's new book are on sale, and he'll be pleased to sign them right outside the room following the program. I'm John Diaz, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. Thank you, Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks very much.